the book of Numbers, and that means you guys need to be reading through Numbers 1 through 36. And to be honest with you, I, I had to do, sit down and do some more study on the book of Numbers last night, and I think I've got a better grasp on it now. But I'm trying to learn and grow how to study uh, God's Word as well. And to be honest, Numbers, for me personally, is a little bit more of a difficult book, or has been, to get my arms around. Uh, I get Leviticus. I get Deuteronomy. I understand the, the narrative of Numbers, but some of this stuff I'm kind of like... Why is it here? How does it fit in? And, and that's kind of what I want to be able to see is how the book organizes. And it's not that easy to outline as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, Patrick. What did we do yesterday? Um, we just talked briefly about the end of Leviticus. That's, I think that's what, uh, right? People were here. We yeah. talked about Leviticus uh, 26. Um, yeah. So, and by the way, guys, I, uh, I record these lectures so that you have them later. Um, I haven't posted them on like uh, Google Classroom or anything, but I do have, if you look up my name on YouTube, you can go to uh, Old Testament survey. I have a playlist of all these lectures. So if you're ever missing something, uh, you can uh, look that up. So it's my goal to be able to have that as a resource for, for people to uh, to look at and study with their, if they're gone or miss something or want to review or this or that. Okay? Um, so anyway, but now we're getting into the book of Numbers, which kind of continues the narrative of, uh, of the book of Exodus. And it adds in laws and rules and different things that are going on. The laws are going to come up because of the situations of Israel in the wilderness. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a situation where you've been in a club or a team or some type of group where you said, okay, here are the rules for the group before the group starts. Then as the group starts and stuff starts coming up, you say, okay, we need to add some other rules because we have other situations. Um, not necessarily bad, but just we need to kind of address these things. And so, you know, let me give an example. Why do other... Um, why do new laws come up sometimes? Why do they, in general, for good or bad, create new laws? Uh, yeah, Sophia, then Bryn. Because they find a problem and they're trying to rectify it. Yeah, they find a problem they're trying to, to rectify it. They're trying to deal with a situation they didn't see ahead of time. So God uh, brings up these things of how to live uh, with him as they're in the desert, how to live according to each other for this temporary time before they're more permanently locked into uh, the promised land where they're going to settle permanently. Okay, So let's talk about the name of the book. Okay, So the name of the book, we call it Numbers, okay? and there's a certain uh, reason for that. Um, do you guys know the, I don't have the meme for this, but uh, do you guys know the cheesy uh, the Christian pickup lines? Have you guys heard of these? Yeah. Um, there's one that goes with the book of Numbers where, you know, the guy comes up and he's like, I was reading through the book of Numbers and I realized I didn't have your number or <laughs> something like that. But we call it Numbers. The Hebrew name is a little different. I think the Hebrew name is really helpful for understanding the nature of this book. Um, but why is it called uh, the book of Numbers? Why is it uh, referred to as this? Yeah, Patrick? Because there's a lot of censuses. Yeah, there's two big uh, censuses taken in the book. One is in Numbers chapter 1. One is in Numbers chapter 26. And these two censuses, uh, they're not taken of every single person, but they're taken of Israel's military men 20 and above. Okay, so these are kind of a, a war and military census. Okay, and there's two of them. Because you guys know what a census is, right? It's the counting up of people for a certain reason. Because people are born, people die, people move. We do censuses every, I think, 20 years in the United States. Uh, and that's actually spelled out in the Constitution to figure out, okay, who lives where now? How much political representation do they get? This and that. Um, but why are there two censuses? And I want to focus in on this because this really gets at, I think, the main issue at hand in the book of Numbers. Why are there two uh, accountings of the people? 
Oh, because Patrick. the first generation dies out and they can only go into the promised land once the first generation is completely gone. Right. It's still Israel, and God is making them into a nation, but they are two different generations. Generation one is the Exodus generation. Generation two is the children of the Exodus generation. And uh, generation one will not go into the promised land. They will not trust God, they will not believe God, and therefore they will not obey God when God says, enter the promised land. In Numbers, you're going to see a lot of rebellion, disobedience to God, a lot of complaining, a lot of testing God, and the, of this whole generation. Okay, And so, in Numbers 14, when they don't go into the land, God says, uh, this whole generation is never going to go into the land. They're going to die in the wilderness because that's what they ask for in Numbers 14. They're like, it'd be better if we died in the wilderness. And God says, okay. And then they say, no, we'll go into the land now. We're, we, we, we sinned, we'll go. And, God says, and Moses says, no, your, your opportunity to do that is gone. If you go into the land, God will not come with you. The Ark of the Covenant will not go with you. I will not go with you. And Moses stays in the camp. They try to go into the land, and they get uh, they get beat out. They they get a bunch of them get killed, and they and they realize we can't go unless God goes. And we lost our opportunity uh, to go when God told us to go. So this whole generation uh, is wasted in a sense. And so the the rest of the Bible will point back to another time this week. I want to look at. New Testament references that refer back to the situations in number. Uh, there's actually quite a few of them. There's Jesus' life, we'll talk about that a little bit today. Jesus talks about being like the bronze serpent that Moses lifted up. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 uses situations and numbers to warn the people and say, hey, the people of God back then, this is what they were doing. Not all of them were, were saved. And, uh, and then the author of Hebrews will say, hey, remember, everybody was in this group, experienced all of God's goodness, miracles, and salvation from Exodus, but not everybody was saved because they didn't believe, and they didn't enter into God's rest. So he, now he warns the people in Hebrews, he says, look, if you don't believe Jesus and cling on to Jesus as the only way, and, and if you try to back away from Jesus, you're going to be like that generation that dies in the wilderness. Um, so Numbers comes up, actually, as I was thinking about it, quite a bit in the New Testament. Um, and so what we have is Numbers chapter 1, census number 1. Numbers chapter 26, census number 2, because it's generation number 2. Now, generation number 2 will enter the land, but the question is, uh, will they be obedient? And then Moses, is he going to go with them or not? No. Uh, no. No, he sins in Numbers chapter 20. And God says, you're not going to go into the land. And so Moses, before he dies, and they're on the edge of the land, Moses has to have kind of a Bible conference and review of the law and preach to them, here is what the law is, here's what you're supposed to do when you get in there, here's how you're supposed to settle the land, and here's kind of the, what's going to go on for your future. But Moses does not, he has hope in what God's going to do, but he, he does not think that generation number two is going to obey, because um, he experiences their disobedience as well. So, but Moses says, I'm not going, uh, going with you. Yeah. So is Moses alive in Deuteronomy? Yeah, yeah, he's alive. Yeah. He's there preaching his last set of like sermons, and then he dies. Uh, the Deuteronomy records his his death, and then they go into the land uh, led by Joshua. Okay, and that's where the narrative uh, picks up. The, there are two people who make it out of generation number one that God permits to go into the land. Uh, who are they? Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua. Caleb representing righteous Israel. Joshua. Uh, representing where Moses failed, there you know there's a replacement. Joshua uh, will take over, but you can imagine being them and having to wait around for 40 years, you know, because of the disobedience of everybody else in their uh, in their generation. Okay, 
And so that's kind of what the book deals with. And then it gives laws, ceremonies, how they're supposed to orient themselves around God because of how, uh, what's going on in the desert. Different things come up. And so the Hebrew name of the book, uh, Hebrew names come from usually the first couple of verses. So Genesis, uh, Genesis is more the Greek uh, name for the book which is, you know, Genesis is appropriate, that's what it means. Um, but the, the uh, Hebrew name of Genesis is in the beginning. Okay, so uh, Exodus is a fine name, Leviticus is a fine name. Actually, Leviticus, it, it maybe shouldn't be called uh, Leviticus because that makes people think that it's just about the Levites, just about the priests. But it's not, it's about everybody. Um, Leviticus could be called, and he called from the tent of meeting, that God gives instructions about worship. Uh, let's look at Numbers 1.1. 1, 1. Some of you look at Numbers, uh, read us uh, Numbers 1.1, 1, 1, and we'll talk about what this book is about. Yeah, Sophia, do you want to read? Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tent of meeting on the first of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying. Okay, so the good news is, God can talk to Moses now. Moses can be in the tent of meeting. So Leviticus kind of worked in that sense. But what could, uh, using verse 1, what could we name this book? What's the focus? Where are they going to be most of the time? Wilderness. Wilderness, Wilderness. yeah. And so this, the name of the book in Hebrew, yeah, yeah. The name of the book in Hebrew is basically just in the wilderness, okay? And that's where this generation is going to die and stay, right? And that's where the story takes place before they enter the promised land, okay? Now, wilderness has a wider idea in, um, in scripture, okay? <clears throat> we think of wilderness just as the desert. It's desolate. It's hot. Not a lot of water. Not a lot of food not a lot of vegetation, and all that's true. That was true of the wilderness. But the wilderness is going to create like a concept for the rest of the Bible of Israel's failure. That's what, you're gonna, you, what you and I should think about when we hear the word wilderness going forward. Israel's failure, rebellion, sin, their unbelief, refusal to trust God, their uh, death, their disobedience. It's also the place of uh, the place of testing and temptation. Okay, the wilderness is the place of testing and temptation. This is where God puts Israel to the test, and this is also where Israel tries to disobediently flip the script and do what? God puts Israel to the test, which is appropriate. But what's not appropriate is for Israel to what? Test God. Test God. Yeah. And so, I'll give you an example of this. What I didn't tell you guys today is that we were going to be taking a test. No, I'm just kidding. But I could do that because I'm the teacher, right? But if I walked in and, and one of you guys said, or another student in another class said, hey, Mr. Morty, you got to sit down and take this test. That wouldn't be make sense, right? Because the role is not appropriate, right? It's like, I'm not the test receiver, uh, I'm the test giver in this role as the teacher, right? So that's kind of like, I, I mean, I had a student a few years ago who was uh, really like um, disrespectful, disobedient, a uh, senior, and was, was failing uh, my class, which he needed to graduate, all this stuff. And um, was very manipulative. I would, would talk back to me, would be very disrespectful. And uh, I told him, I said, look, you've got to get this work done because you have got to uh, pass my class in order to graduate. And uh, I said, if you don't, I, I said, I, I'm not going to you know, give you good grades for, for not doing the work and for failing the work and not, you know, uh, not doing what's appropriate, doing what's right. And he basically said to me that if he, I said, you're, I said, you're not going to graduate high school if you don't pass this class. And he said to me, that's on you. And I said, you seem to not understand how this is working. I said, we're not equals. I'm the teacher and, and you are the student. I said, I've already passed high school. I said, if you fail this class by not doing your work, Nothing bad happens to me. 
I said, but you will graduate, not graduate high school. It is not on me, it's on you. And so, but that's the attitude of trying to flip the situation. He's trying to test me. And instead of submitting to the testing that, that takes place in the, the classroom, okay? Well, and, but that's often what we in our disobedience do to God. God is, is supposed to be the one to test us, to show us what's in our hearts, to actually prove if we're loyal to him, love him, will obey him or not, to, because it's easy to say, okay, well, yeah, I'll do everything God says, but then when God puts the pressure on, uh, are they going to trust God or not, right? They're going to be in places where they don't have water, they don't have food, and they're going to grumble and complain and say, well, is God trying to kill us out here? Um, and that's... And then they're going to try to test God, which they do in Exodus 16, and they do, God says, they tried to test him ten times in, uh, in the wilderness, and which is, not, um, which is not appropriate. God testing his people is putting them through trial, putting them through temptation to reveal whether they actually love God and obey him or not. People testing God is saying, God, if you're really here, if you're really God, you'll do what I say you do, and I will judge whether or not you're really God. Okay, So that's what testing God is. That's what Israel said in Exodus 16. Is Yahweh among us or not? If he is, then he'll do exactly what I say. Okay, But if God just says, okay, I'll obey you and do what exactly you say, then he's not God. Right? So there's... There's no appropriate way of us testing God, right? But, so Israel, uh, what you need to think about is Israel's uh, place of testing in the wilderness. If it was a pass-fail, how does Israel do, according to the book of Numbers, in the wilderness? They, they, kind of fail. they fail. They fail the test, yeah. But look at, um, somebody read uh, Matthew 4.1, because who else goes into the wilderness? Jesus. Jesus, yeah. And so that's what we'll look at here of uh, Matthew 4.1. We'll see a little bit of, of New Testament. So think about this background. If this is where Israel has always failed the test, and they've always put God to the test and disobeyed him. Yeah, Vivian, go ahead and read uh, Matthew 4.1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Mm -hmm. So Jesus gets baptized. He's uh, starting his ministry. And after he gets baptized, God affirms him from heaven as his son, Holy Spirit's on. The Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. Why? Uh, to, to test him? To test him, to be tempted by the devil. Yeah, to, so Jesus is going to enter this uh, area, this arena, where everybody else has basically failed. That's what is, is going on here. And so... The devil is going to present temptations to Jesus, and the question is, is Jesus going to trust and obey God uh, and come out on the other side alive, unlike Israel, or is he going to fail like everybody else uh, fails? Uh, somebody read uh, Deuteronomy 8, 2, and 3. This is Moses' commentary on numbers, on them being in the wilderness. Yeah, Patrick, do you want to read that yeah. one? Eight. Okay. Eight verses two and three. <clears throat> and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you for these forty years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you did, would keep his commands or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Yeah. So, why Moses says, okay, why did God put them in the wilderness? In order to what? Yeah. Test them. Test them. See what is, prove what is in their heart, whether they'll obey God or not. And he said, he let you be hungry in order to humble you, right? So they could trust God. And there's actually, we'll look at in Numbers, there's a righteous way to complain, um, to ask God for what you need and then to present, God, I need water and food to survive. Can you, you know, please, you know, provide this? Instead of saying, if you're really God, you'll do it the way I say. Um, and so, who says, though, okay, 
Uh, Israel complains, they test God, but who says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? Yeah. Didn't you say that? Yeah. When Jesus is told by uh, Satan, since you're the son of God, make these stones into bread. Take a shortcut. You know, uh, which remember, Israel's complaining that they don't have bread in the wilderness. Okay, so Jesus is being humbled. He's being tested. And he says, well, just make it. You can, you're better than Moses. You're the son of God. You can do this. And Jesus says that he will not uh, test God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So he says, it's up to God whether or not I will have uh, have bread. We know God, Jesus can multiply bread. He does later, uh, showing that he's, he's greater than Moses as well, but not at this time. So he, he passes that test. And then somebody read uh, um, Deuteronomy 6.16. Deuteronomy 6.16. Uh, Macy, you want to read that one? Uh, yeah. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. Yeah. So at Massah is in, um, that's fine. It's at, that is in uh, Exodus 16 and 17 when Moses uh, strikes the rock, when he's supposed to strike the rock, which uh, has water. Okay, so, but Moses says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Who else uh, says that? It is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Sophia? Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, to the other temptation, Satan says, okay, do this, jump off the temple, the angels will come and get you, and then you will prove to everybody that you're really the son of God. And so God, uh, Jesus says, no, it's written that you do not put God to the test. You do not <clears throat> manipulate circumstances in order to try to manipulate God to make God do something in order to prove he's true, right, uh, or real, okay? And so Jesus, uh, unlike Israel, does not test God, but Jesus allow, humbles himself and allows himself uh, to be tested. Yes, okay? Yeah. Um, okay, so what you see here is Jesus enters the, the place of Israel's testing, but he actually comes out, uh, comes out alive. Okay, so Israel fails, Jesus uh, succeeds. So if you understand the background of the book of Numbers, then you really get what's going on in places like Matthew 4, Luke 4, when Jesus goes, uh, goes into the wilderness. Because it's kind of like, okay, he's the Messiah. He's, is, can he be true Israel? Uh, can he, will he make it or not? And the answer is yes, uh, because he trusts God. Right? So, but Israel's uh, failure is in... Uh, is in the background there. And I, I don't know if I, I think I brought this up yesterday. How many years is Israel in the wilderness? 40. 40. You guys remember why they're in the wilderness for 40 years? Um, I mean, why that number? Why? Uh, because Four years for each temptation? For each day. That for, yeah, for each day that they are disobedient, God says, I'm going to give you a year. Okay, mm -hmm. Brent, is that what you're going to say? Yeah. So, how, how many days is Jesus in the wilderness? 40. Jesus takes uh, the obedient track, which happens to be the short track, and Israel, they t could have taken the short track. They take, uh, God gets them set up, they move out, they have an 11-day journey, and they could have entered the promised land, and, and then that could have been done. But instead they say, no, we'll take the 40-year plan. Right? So they have to wait for 40 more years while the, right on the edge, basically, of, uh, of the promised land. And so um, let's look at a few other things here. So basically the, uh, the book focuses on, zooms in on basically two years. Okay? Year two, this is, they're basically, this is the second year after the Exodus. They've been camped at Mount Sinai for about a year as God gives its law, the commandments, the golden calf incident, building of the tabernacle, all this stuff. They've been camped there for about a year, okay? And then they don't go into the land, and then they the, the narrative kind of picks up and focuses in on year 40 when they're about to enter the land again, okay? This in-between space, not a lot is written about it um, because it basically just shows it's all this uh, wasted time, okay? Um, and you, can, you guys can imagine, like, 40 years is a long time. Um, imagine if you're just waiting around 
to die. Like you're, you know, you're not really going to, that's, that's all that uh, this generation is going to experience. But then uh, chapter two, God gives them <coughs> their uh, formation, how they're to organize themselves uh, around God, how they're supposed to march, how they're supposed to camp, how they're supposed to live in relationship to God in relationship to one another, and how they're not supposed to get too close to God, how they're supposed to pack up the tabernacle, right? Because you can't just go and touch the ark. You can't just touch the tabernacle because what would happen? You die. You die. So there's instructions for how to carry all this stuff, how to pack it, what the priests are supposed to do. And so Israel's formation, um, let me go ahead and I'm going to turn on the uh, projector for a second and show you something on the screen just briefly, but Israel's formation uh, surrounds the tabernacle when they camp and the Ark of, uh, of the Covenant. And then how does Israel know when they're supposed to go and when they're supposed to uh, remain. Yeah. When the giant cloud moves. Yeah, when the cloud of uh, <coughs> the pillar of cloud or fire, depending on the time of day, uh, if it moves. Okay, so even if they're supposed to stay there for a long time, they wait. They don't go with, unless they follow God. Okay, so the question is okay, are they going to uh, learn to follow God or not? Yeah. It says in uh, Numbers when uh, Moses was once again convincing God not to kill all the Israelites, right. uh, that the other countries could like see the t- pillar of fire and smoke. Right. So they knew like that God was on their side. Right, they can see God with them. And, and you, we talk about like God being with us and stuff like that. But you could imagine like when it, he says, you, after they disobey and say they're not going into the land, and then they say, just kidding, we will go into the land. Uh, after God says, fine, die in the wilderness. Um, they, you could imagine when God says, I'm not going to go with you, it's visible, right? It's not like, okay, you just say God be with you, and it's like, okay, we just mean providentially, and that God's in control. But literally, the, the pillar stays put. Nobody, God is not going. So it's like, okay, you can go try it on your own, but I'm not coming, and, uh, and you won't make it. So yeah, the other nations could see. Okay, so... You have this organization of all the tribes uh, surrounding the tent of meeting. Why is the tent of meeting at uh, the center, at the middle? Because it's the most important place, and it's the place all the tribes meet at. Yeah, it's this is the place. Uh, it's it's centrally located, right? It's the place where the God is at the middle. He's at the center. That Israel is oriented around him. And then there are rules for not getting too close to the tabernacle where the Levites are supposed to be. Who's supposed to lead? You have Judah out here. They're going to lead when they, uh, when they march and they move east. Um, and so they have these different areas of how the camps are even supposed to be laid out and then what the responsibilities are. Yeah. Why are there 16 tribes? 16 tribes? Oh, because um, these two are called half-tribes. Um, so Ephraim and Manasseh are Joseph's sons, and they kind of get to be kind of half-tribes. So if you put them together, you'd have, that'd be, oh, I guess that would be 14. No, okay, well, we're looking here at totals, right? So, uh, so total. Oh. Um, and then there's a little bit of debate about these numbers. Um, you know, the, the, there's a word that's translated thousands, uh, which would mean that there would be some uh, millions amount of uh, Israel's, uh, Israelites in the, the, the desert. Um, but it could also be translated clans, and I don't think that threatens the, the truth of the text in any way, which would mean it would be a much smaller number. But anyway, um, that's one of the issues there. So that's, uh, yeah, you see, Cheryl? Um, so anyway, yeah, that's a, a cat show. That's not my cat show. That's Lion King. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> but uh, so even Israel, like every aspect of what they're doing, they're supposed to how they're supposed to walk, how they're supposed to carry the stuff. Okay, look at Numbers uh, two two. It says at the end, it says they shall camp around the tent of meeting at a distance. Right? You get too close, you die. So there's. Um, 
these instructions for, for all this type of stuff. And then there's more instructions through uh, basically chapter 3 through uh, 6 about the, the laws for uh, priests and other things, how to be a Nazarite, all this stuff. Yeah? Uh, I was going to read. Oh, you want to read 2 too? Sure. Okay, how about you read uh, 2, 32 through 34? Because I kind of read uh, 2 2 already. Oh. 33 through 34? Uh, 32 through 34. Okay. These are the people of Israel as listed by their father's houses. All those listed in the camps by their companies were 603,550. But the Levites were not listed among the people of, this, of Israel, as the, Lord God, as the Lord commanded Moses. Thus did the people of Israel, according to all that God had commanded Moses, so they camped by their standards, and so they set out each to each one to his clan, according to his father's house. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, was Aaron in the tribe of Levi? Yes. So was Moses in the tribe of Levi? Yes. Uh, yeah, they're both of that kind of priestly tribe. Um, so Moses kind of acts like a priest as well, but he's obviously kind of like really in charge. But Aaron is the like head of that kind of, like it narrows down kind of the head of that priestly uh, family. Um, so yes, uh, Moses is of the Levites uh, as well. Right? Um, so yeah, good question. Um, okay, so they, they finally, they're going to set out, right? But there's like 10 chapters where you're like, are they going to move or not? Um, but look at chapter 6 at the end. Um, you get Aaron's prayer. You get Aaron's uh, benediction, his blessing on, uh, on the people, right? And this kind of describes what, how they're to think about what it means to be blessed, to be in the presence of God, uh, to be God's people, what God is accomplishing. And God gives them this prayer, uh, which you guys have probably heard before, maybe at the end of church or someone, someone's read this. But number 6, uh, 22, it says, Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel, and say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord uh, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. So we have here this, uh, and then he says, So that they shall invoke my name uh, on the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. So we have this idea. Remember God says, I'm going to bless you, right? There's... It sounds like Genesis 1 and 2. God blesses his creation. It's in, it's in a state of uh, blessing and rest. Um, and everything's good, right? But then he talks to Abraham. I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. We'll see that in this book. Even though Israel's disobedient, what we'll see is when um, this bad king tries to hire this bad sorcerer or prophet to curse Israel. He's like saying, I want you to say like this spell basically and curse Israel. And God actually decides to talk to this bad prophet, Balaam, and says, okay, you have to say exactly what I say. And Balaam says, okay, I'll say what exactly what you say. And every time the king asks Balaam to curse Israel, Balaam speaks an oracle where, from God where he ex actually blesses Israel. And so the king gets mad every time and he's like, why do you keep doing this? I keep telling you these three times to curse Israel. And he said, I, I have to say whatever God says. He goes, look, trust me, I want to take your money and just tell you and curse Israel, but I can't do it. And so throughout the whole book, Israel's rebelling and disobeying, but God... Uh, does not allow them to ultimately be uh, be cursed. Yeah. Uh, is that the same Balaam with the donkey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we'll see. Is the ba Balaam's talking donkey that the angel of the Lord is mm -hmm. uh, is blocks the way, and Balaam's riding to try to go uh, curse Israel, and the donkey knows something's up and does not proceed. So so Balaam starts beating the heck out of his donkey. <laughs> And the donkey, the angel of the Lord uses the donkey, and the donkey turns around to Balaam and says, why do you keep hitting me? <laughs> and this, the funny thing is from that is not just that the donkey, the angel of the Lord uses the donkey to talk to Balaam, right, showing that the, Bala, that the donkey's smarter than, than Balaam, 
But also, Balaam answers back, and he's like, because you're not moving. And, the, uh, and then God opens his eyes to see the angel, and Balaam's like, oh, I didn't know. Then he, then he tries to go on anyway, but um, yeah, so he even, uh, even when a donkey talks to him, he's not uh, sensible of listening to truth. Now, he's not able to curse Israel, but what he is able to get them to do is to join themselves to uh, and abandon Yahweh and join themselves to the god uh, Baal, and, uh, and sin in gross uh, sexual immorality through false worship. And uh, that's in Numbers 25. So it's like false prophecy, you know, they could handle that, but they're brought down by sexual sin. And that leads them into idolatry. And uh, Moses is commanded by God, take all the leaders, not just execute them in broad daylight, but impale them and hang them up in front of everybody. Right, um, and so he says, all the leaders are going to die on behalf of their on, on behalf of their people. They're going to be pierced, right? Um, but the good news of that, Deuteronomy picks up on this and makes that a law that leadership uh, dies under the curse of God by being hung up and pierced. Okay, who, as a good person, actually dies as a leader being hung up and pierced? Jesus. Jesus, yeah. So Jesus is able to take on the curse of God, the wrath of God, in a positive way, where these guys deserved it, uh, but Jesus is able to actually uh, take on the being pierced. Um, and so that's what, yeah, that's where the talking donkey, but we haven't gotten there, uh, gotten there quite yet. But basically you're going to see God still tries to bless them. God still has a plan ultimately to bless them uh, throughout this time. Um, and, it, and that idea of blessing is God causing his face to shine upon you, God looking favorably toward you, being in the presence of God. And the book of Hebrews, they, they couldn't go before God in the Holy of Holies. So the book of Hebrews, though, talks about that Jesus has gone into the veil ahead of us so that we can actually approach, uh, approach God face to face. Um, so that's actually accomplished in, uh, in Jesus. So we should actually approach God more and not, uh, not less, not keep ourselves at a distance. Okay, so, but we'll see as the kind of the question of is Israel going to follow God or are there, they not? And spoiler alert, they're not. They're not going to follow God. Um, and you'll see over and over and over again, they will refuse to uh, follow God. Um, not just refusing to go into the land, but they will, I mean, basically every chapter has some element of rebellion or disobedience. Um, and the next generation won't be that much better. They'll, they'll disobey too. And that's what Moses says. He's like, you didn't obey while I was alive. I don't think you're going to obey after I'm dead. Uh, and so he's, and then he tells him, go into the land. Um, okay, got it.